Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Color of Science Digital Edition. I'm your host, Dr. Frederick Bertley, AKA Dr. B, host of QED with Dr. B and Dr. B in three, and of course, the president and CEO of COSI, the number one science museum in the nation, two years in a row, according to USA Today. Now, as you know, the Color of Science is our incredible program where we showcase to you amazing men and women from a diversity of backgrounds. And today is no exception. But before I get to our stellar guest, just some housekeeping, I got to recognize our sponsors. So I want to begin by acknowledging all those organizations who provide extraordinary support to make this series happen. First and foremost, our presenting sponsors, Patel and L Brands. Our lead funder, the Curtis T. and Beverly Cheeks Jewel Family Foundation. And I also want to thank the additional friends and family who make this happen to thrive in our community. So thank you for allowing us to bring this great program. Now, as we continue to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month to recognize the achievements and contributions of Hispanic champions who've inspired others to achieve success, today we are interviewing an incredible, incredible, distinguished Cuban-American concert pianist Dr. Orlai Alonzo, AKA Dr. A for the rest of this show. All right, Dr. Alonzo has graced the stages of some of the most prestigious concert halls in the United States and Canada and around the world. He has garnered top prizes at numerous national and international piano competitions. He earned his doctorate, that's a PhD in musical arts degree from The Ohio State University in 2015 and holds graduate degrees from Yale and the Manhattan School of Music. Dr. Alonzo also recently joined the faculty at Capital University's Conservatory of Music and frequently performs at concert venues across the entire state of Ohio. He appears alongside Christopher Purdy and co-host of Musica Cubana uh, par as part of WSU's Radio Music in the Mid-Ohio series. Wow, we are so lucky to have this incredible, extraordinary, academic, musician, concert pianist right here with us in Columbus. After you listen to this interview, you may be feeling inspired to learn more about Cuba during Hispanic Heritage Month. Well, did you know that COSI actually has a bit of Cuba in it? It's very hard to travel to Cuba, but you can come to COSI and visit our Cuba experience, which is brought to you by the American Museum of Natural History out of New York City. So come check that out. Learn all you want to learn about the Cuban Latino community and heritage and history. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. A, the incredible pianist, academic, um, scholar, and just all around great talent in our community. Dr. Alonzo, come on in. Hello, here I am. Thank you, Dr. B. It's amazing to be here with the COSI family and with you in person, virtually in person. I feel like I'm out on a date already. <laughs> well, it, it is so good to have you here. I mean, your CV, your bio is what I call stacked, just incredibly <laughs> talented, incredibly prolific. So we're thrilled the color science that you decided to join us today on this extraordinary talk. Um, as you know, we always want our great guests to share a little bit about their story. So whenever you're ready, if you want to share your screen and walk us through some stuff. And then I'm going to ask you some questions in an interview style, after which we have a lot of questions from eager kids and adults from what we say from womb to tomb. We have a lot of questions for you. I'll ask those towards, towards the close of the program. And then we'll close up with our amazing, really exciting STEAM challenge that's going to be all about your great work, music and math. Hit it, Sam. Sounds amazing. I'll be happy to share the screen. Here I go. Let's get all done. And go, here I come, let's see. It should be there any second now. As the there it is, goes. a quote. Okay, so here we start with Schopenhauer. So why not start music with philosophers? So as he said, music in no way is like the other arts. Music is so much more powerful and penetrating than the other arts. It speaks of the essence of things. Please come, me, come with me to a musical journey of not just music, music, mathematics, and poetic form so that you can see what it entails. Now, Let's start back at school when I was at Yale and during a lesson with a professor of mine, Claude Frank, he asked me, can you get through a piece of music in your mind without playing it as you're laying in bed and closing your eyes and saying, can I get through this music and will 
My answer was a resounding, no, I cannot. In that moment, it was when I realized that many months of vigorous practicing and getting everything committed to memory, I certainly could not get through the piece without looking at the score. So it was really this realization that led me to the question of how does one learn a piece? How does one have the process of learning at uh, any level? So this relationship uh, expanded to answering a single question. Can you get, get through a score mentally? To addressing even bigger questions, which is, do you know how the work was conceived? Are you aware of the compositional methods? Do you understand the overall structure? Hint, hint, math. Are you able to identify every single melody and key? Well, it was Claude Frank who believed that performers should also learn to compose in order to truly understand and convey the meaning of music. And that realization led me, I have to learn more of the compositional techniques. I have to learn more about this. So in order to answer those questions, before we dive into our musical mathematical explorations, Let's go to yet another genre, poetry, another art form. So I'll read this poem. I have no life but this, to lead it here, nor any death but lest dispelled from there, nor tie to earths to come, nor action new, except through this extent, the realm of you. I transcribe this Emily Dickinson poem to the layout of prose rather than its original verse to show you how difficult it is to analyze music or poetry or anything when it is in prose, when it is not in its original format of rhyme and meter and verses. So now here it goes. What are the advantages of looking at something or a poem in its rightful shape? Now we can clearly see its architectural design. One poem made up of two stanzas with four verses per stanza, where green represents rhyme as in a ballad, with alternating six and four syllables per verse. Not to mention that it helps the reader in the poetic delivery of the work. So after analyzing the poem in both prose and poetic form, it becomes clear that printed music has been published in prose for over 500 years, written with the economy of space in mind from a printing perspective. How absurd is that? Now, what do I mean by musical prose? I mean the traditional organization of the printed score is one long continuous black dot line that just goes forever with no relevant way, just the fact that the printer wanted to save money and put as much content in one little piece of paper. I understand that in the past, but we're in the 21st century and I believe that one can organize music in a digital way. And I believe that once we organize music in a coherent phrase structure, the form or the architecture of the music will reveal itself. Here's my proposed score layout. As I said, 21st century, we don't need an actual paper score. We can have a digital score such as this and you can zoom in and zoom out and put it in your iPad. So we'll use Bach, one of the most famous fugues of Bach to drive the point across. Now, let's go back to our poetry. If we think of instrumental music as a song without word, a poetic analysis can be accomplished through the mathematical concepts that rule poetic form. So what are the advantages of this form? For the sake of poetry, let us consider this entire quote-unquote fugue as a sonnet. For at first glance, we can see that Bach's sonnet is made up of two stanzas with four verses per stanza, and horizontally, the poetic analysis yields a poetic octave, eight lines. And now if we consider the vertical analysis of the work, we are separating them from their original context. The episodes take a new meaning. It is through this or the verses, through this vertical analysis that we can contextualize the episodes in the poetic stanza from the new poetic form as refrain and verse alternating back and forth. When we analyze the episodes individually or the verses, we now, they now represent a new poetic stanza. And we realize that the newly formed stanza is comprised of six verses. 
That's why the reason I call this a sonnet associated with this piece because of the Petrarchan sonnets of the Italian Renaissance that have exactly that, the octave and the sestet. So you have all of that connected in the music already. And of course it happened before Bach. So he knew what was happening poetically before his time. I have so many questions. Um, we're going to dial it back. Folks, you're listening to another incredible Color of Science Digital Edition. I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Orlai Alonzo, otherwise known as Dr. A. He's an incredible <laughs> musician with a doctorate in music. Um, plus, he's an incredible concert pianist, which we're going to hear something from his music in a little bit. Um, but let me, let me just dial it way back here, because this was incredible. Um, you mentioned your father was a mathematician. Yes. You are a music scholar and a musician from basics. How did you get into music? Well, that was easy. It was all at home. My house, it was all music. My brother is a pianist. My aunt is a, was my first piano teacher. My cousins are all musicians. I have a violinist. I have a composer, pianist. Uh, my uncle is the guitarist. So this, I come from a very musical family. The only ones that are not musicians are my parents and they're mathematicians, both of them. So music was in my house at all times. So from my brother practicing all day long music and from the schools, from being around everywhere, music was literally everywhere for me. So that was an easy, being born in Cuba, music is literally all around you. Now the things, getting started in music, it was more for me uh, following, of course, as a younger brother, following on the older brother's footsteps mm -hmm. and seeing what you can do. And you know you have help within the family. But it was still a passion for, for me to know that I wanted music in my life and that I knew even from a very young age that I couldn't get through life without music. And in Cuba, it's very different. The, the schooling and everything, you have to get into music by third grade. If you miss the boat, you do not go to study in music school. You do not get to become a musician. If you are a guitar player, maybe, you know, or play bigger instruments, like a double bass, then you have to, or wind instruments, fifth grade is your cutoff line because they want you, it's like an Olympic sports music. You literally have to start it early because Cuba has that uh, double European tradition from before the Castro era and the Russian tradition that came, that was brought in during the revolution. So of course we got a mixture of schooling that was very strict Russian, but yet taught by teachers who were trained in the European tradition. So we grew up loving, you know, music from all styles, but we had to do it like your life depended on it. I did, you know, sports, but music won out in that sense, getting to music. I wanted to do sports, I wanted to play, but my brother was playing at home and I, I had to continue and I had his help so that getting started in music was easy because, you know, if you fail your exams, you cannot pass to the next level. So you have to be ready every year. So proficiency had to be kept up. So you had to practice and it was like, brother, I have an exam, help me. So he would sit with me and practice and help me out. So it goes a long way to have help and it goes a long way to be immersed in a musical society, so to speak. Sure, sure. Well, look, that, so that's, so clearly you had it in your entire ecosystem. And, <laughs> and you mentioned that, that now at this point, you mentioned both your parents were mathematicians. At what point did you, did you as a kiddo or a young adult make the connection from music to math? The second my dad hit my head and said, sit down there and listen, gentlemen, you youngster. And uh, the, the connection was made, in a sense, it was always there because my parents always said, you know, music and mathematics go hand in hand. This is always here. It is 100% related. And of course, they always sat down with us and did all of our math homework. If I wanted to answer something quickly, mom, give me the answer. If I wanted the understanding version of anything mathematical, 
dad, what's the answer to this? And he would go back to the beginning of times and explain <laughs> how, you know, this number was created and who the original classical antiquity guy that did such and such was. So I loved it in that sense. So for me, it was my parents making sure that we had, you know, the best training, the best possible education in that sure. sense and at home. But again, in the beginning, we don't even realize it. We don't see the connections. We learn all the rhythmic patterns. We learn the structure and the form. But if we had known early on, that's the thing. My love for music and math connected grew as an adult. It wasn't nurtured as a child, which I believe it should be. I should, I believe we together, Dr. B and Dr. A, can reinstitute the quadrivium and get music, cosmology, and you know, and math, science together. I'm ready. Dr. <laughs> Dr. A, I'm totally ready. So well, let me ask you a question about that. So I'm gonna go off script here a bit. So clearly there's an undeniable connection to not just music and math, but I love how you began music and math poetry, prose, it's all connected. Let's talk about popular culture, right? So let's talk about the Beatles, Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Jay-Z, you know, um, Taylor Swift, like whatever popular music out there. What percentage of the artists do you think have, not, not your doctoral level, of course, understanding, but just a general connection of the math and music piece. Do you think that's there in a typical artist today? I, I doubt it. I highly doubt it. There are some that I would say, yes, like, you know, Dave Matthews, when you see and you hear his rhythmic patterns, there are some that we don't know here, but Indian artists who have been connected to music and math through their rhythmic patterns are incredibly difficult. But in, in a sense, we believe that even the modern pop artists are related and are connected to this because remember, not all of them write their own music. So the person writing the music might have knowledge. So in turn, it feels like they know what mm -hmm. they're doing. So they could be doing it without knowledge, which happens in music all the time, without knowledge of its existence. Yeah. So I believe they should be more, in, you know, interested in finding those relationships, especially for writing songs. But, and you can see from the modern songs that the refrain and the verses are of equal length, that everything is so symmetrical and so quote unquote, not exciting because it doesn't add up that spice, but you get some jazz artists who are doing that. Some composers that have been trained. So anyone, even the Beatles do some fun stuff because the Beatles were classically trained. So maybe not to the extent of finding the music and mathematics, but they know that there's more there than just a simple, you know, oh, I was inspired by a melody and now I'm going to write it down. This composer's of you know classical baroque and medieval times and renaissance all the way through classical music yeah. knew all of this they were trained and they used them on purpose for the drama for the excitement that's why the music will actually never disappear from you know from society from humanity because Powerful. they have figured out a way to portray a cathedral to you that you don't know you are actually seeing it in your mind through your architectural structure of a piece. You're actually seeing Notre Dame, you know, in inside your vibrations. And if we go even further, everything, as my dad would say, everything is vibration. If you got a string theory. Uh, so in a sense, our bodies know more than ourselves, in a sense. Our mind, our collective mind, actually knows a little more than, than we can really connect. So I hope they do, but to answer your question, I don't believe most of them know. So I hope they, they would definitely add on because it would add so much more spice. It would add so much more energy to the music and so much more drama and make it more exciting. Now we follow a formula that pleases the audience. So instead of the formula that, you know, goes forever, that's my, my fear always that we might love the hottest piece now, but 20 years, 50, 100 years from now, Will that piece still be remembered? Will it hold the test of time? Right. Some of them will not because they did not have what this classical pieces had, which was the structure within them that gave them value, not just for, oh, this is beautiful, but, oh, this is actually well thought out. So there's always something said to be well thought out. 
Well, no, that's true. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of career opportunities, especially for the younger kids who are listening, who are into music and into math, that there's a robust career opportunity and universe of things they can do in terms of working with popular culture and music, et cetera, to make it have a, 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 a longer tail, if you will, to use your words, to spice it up so that it can live longer and, and be more creative. So that's great. So I want to pivot, though, because y- y- your career is just so amazing. So, you know, Cuban-American, um, talented pianist, fast forward, PhD. Now you're a combination of a philosopher, mathematician, and a musician at the academic level. But you're also a soloist for the Columbus Symphony, which you've described as a dream come true. So tell us about that experience. And, and how does one get picked to be a soloist for a symphony, and, 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 et cetera? Oh, that was amazing to be chosen to play for the Columbus Symphony. Uh, well, my joke is always, uh, I, it was a dream come true, but it's also a dream come true that you never knew you had. Because as a Cuban boy growing up in Cuba, when did I ever believe, hey, I'm going to be living in Columbus, Ohio uh, with my family. So in a, in a sense, that dream of playing music has always been there, but playing with specific orchestras is amazing, a world-class orchestra like the Columbus Symphony. So in a sense, this one happened, I was approached by Daniel Walshaw, the artistic assistant director to Ross and Milanov, and we were at Pistachio Vera having some macaroons and coffee and talking about, hey, what can we do together? And what would be great for this new summer night series that we're trying to develop? And I said, You know, all you have to say is we want you to do something. And where do I sign? I'm I'm in. I'm in. I would never say no. And of course, I also had played with a lot of their musicians before for the, you know, over 10 years that I've been here in Columbus. So I have been playing with them at the Columbus Museum of Art. I had played at the Ohio Theater. We did some Poulang Trio, we did some Beethoven Quintet. So I knew the musicians, so my name was already under the radar. Uh, And then when they needed something new that was happening and it was coming out, they said, hey, I know this guy who can play and let's let's reach out and see what happens. So I never turned down any collaboration, actually. And I always enjoy playing, especially for the audience and the following that I have here in Columbus now, which I love them all dearly. So they're part of my family right now. That Look, that's fantastic. And I got to say, I know Daniel very well, actually. And Columbus is, is, is interestingly um, enough, blessed with having a lot of great musical talent. So yes. that's fantastic. All right. Uh, we're listening to The Color Sides. I have the pleasure of, inter- of interviewing Dr. Alonzo, the great pianist scholar, um, just an incredible talent. Uh, we're going to shift now and go to some questions that were submitted from some of our kiddos and schools. So I'm going to read to you the questions. Sometimes they put their age, sometimes they don't. I'm going to start with um, Miss Henry at Olentangy Meadows Elementary. So this is a teacher at an elementary school. She wants to know, how is math used when playing the piano? And secondly, how can students make a future real world connection with math in their own lives. So one, how is math used um, when playing the piano? And then two, how can students make a real world connection with math in their own lives? Shout out to Miss Henry, by the way, at Old Town Humanity. Yes, wow, Miss Henry, those are deep questions, deep, deep, deep. If you saw the presentation or if you're about to see the presentation, I show a little bit of, you know, how music and math play together in the sense of the structure, the architectural form and the design. So in that sense, it's already there. But in real life, meaning in performance, how does it play? For example, the question of do you see the music in your mind? Can you see it? Can you picture it? My piano teacher always said, um, you need gas stations in music. You need places or starting and stopping points that can help you throughout uh, your performance. As a kid, I used to get lost all the time in the middle of a piece because we learned from the beginning to the end, right? And then we play through, through. And then if something happens in the middle, we don't have places to stop. So gas stations are what help you if you get lost, if something happens, how you get out of it is your mathematical understanding of the piece, it's your structure, it's when you practice in sections, it's when you left justify and find the poetic analysis and say, 
Here, now let's start on second, you know, refrain verse or a second, you know, part. So it's using all of the things. Some of them require premeditated work. You have to work at it. It doesn't happen, you know, instantaneously. But that would, I would say that would help in performance, knowing what is happening. And then you can, maybe it's impossible to remember every single dot unless you're a prodigy and you have visual memory that you can close your eyes, which some people have, and actually see the score in your brain. You can see everything that your visual, you know, can, can allow, but I don't have that. So when I close, I know sections. I can visualize the beginning of something. So if you have those little gas stations, that I think is a very perfect way of saying, I can use tangible form and structure and apply it to my playing and performance so I can do this and I can make it work for me. Now, how do students make the future and real world connection with math in our own lives? That is the quintessential question. That it's it's really really difficult. I do not know the answer to that because I wish like schools would add more in their curriculum of music and math, poetry and math, ways to entice students to get them involved with mathematics. I know now the easiest way is through technology, through games, through coding, through things like that, but it is a new language. It is a completely different, and that's, in a sense, the future. So it's music and technology, I would say, because I would always connect it to music because that's my world and my life could not exist without it. I'm sure there are other ways to, do, to get kids involved in, in math through school, but I would say more arts, more music, more exploration of everything that's around us. And then, yes, you need help as a child, someone trying to explain. So catering to them, depending on their age, of how they, how it actually makes sense, how the connection is there. So it's not up to the child, that's the problem. It's up to the teacher, it is up to the system of education, and it goes all the way up. And more importantly, to the parents. The parents are the ones who could decide, you know what, we have to go to the museum, we have to go to COSA, we have to get exposed to things and ask questions. First, you need to entice them. And in a sense, like as a performer and as a teacher, my kids, my job is to get them excited about music, instill in them something beautiful and something happy, not a hatred toward what we're doing. So in a sense, it's making it, how do we do it happily? How do we do it in a way that they enjoy it? It's not just adding more math, but adding more enjoyable math to their curriculum. Love it. Love that oh, answer. A lot, lot of stuff to unpack, Ms. Henry. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> um, my next question comes from Carlos. He's 12. And Carlos wants to know, what are the most important skills you should work on if you want to become a professional musician. Practice, 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 practice. No, uh, well, every possible skill. Now, not just a skill, I would say the most important, first, find a good teacher, find a good educator, find someone inspiring that can teach you in, in a nurturing way. That way you have a predisposition for it because the last thing you want is to not want to play to be forced to feel like i have to play and practice as you know as a child i didn't want to I, I didn't want to practice i didn't like practicing but you cannot play without practicing so to practice to consciously practice intelligently in structure in phrases to practice with the idea of making each little section better to understand the music, to understand what it is that you're doing, to look back at what has been done, not just go from the common knowledge of the time that you're in, but keep searching back. There's so much history, so much has been done in music education and in art that if you just go with the flow, you're going to miss out on so many things. So I say, have an inquisitive mind, be persistent, make sure that you say, today was not a great day, but tomorrow will be good. My aunt would always say, 
Oh, you don't want to play today. You're so tired. She would say, those are your best lessons. That's when you play the best, when you're at, you know, at your lowest. So it, it requires the help of the parent. It requires, again, the help of the teacher. But you can do it. So persistence, definitely, because it's a long road, the road of music. But be inquisitive and make sure that you pay attention to detail and that you practice and you follow your instructor's uh, directions. Love it. Great answer. All right, Savannah. Savannah's nine years old. She wants to know, got to be honest here, Dr. Uh -oh. Have you ever made a mistake during a live performance? All the time. <laughs> if anyone tells you that they don't make mistakes, it is not true. We all make mistakes. And mistakes are nothing. Again, mistakes is how we learn and it's how we realize what our weaknesses are, not as a person in that specific piece, right? So when you say, oh, I close my eyes, I'm practicing this piece, wherever your mind stops and does not continue, it's exactly where your weakness lies. So then we rely on other stuff. I rely on my ear. And then I rely on my finger uh, muscle memory and I rely on humming and trying to invoke every possible thing. But of course, we all make mistakes and there's nothing wrong with the mistakes. It's how we get out of them that makes us who we are as performers, how we can continue on. How do we know where to jump to and how do we know Oh, Scott, save me. Let's get through this right now. So, yes, a little bit of prayer helps, but also a lot of preparation and practice beforehand. But, yes, I make mistakes, and I'm proud of them. <laughs> that, that's really that, – that, that aligns really well with my favorite engineer, Dean Kamen, um, one of the greatest inventors of our time. He has 440 patents. He says, fail fast. Fail often. It's okay to fail, but it's like you said, Dr. A, you got to learn from your mistake and build on it. All right. Sebastian, right. 15 years old. Sebastian, who's 15, wants to know, if you didn't become a musician, what else would you be doing now? Would you have been a mathematician? <laughs> My dad would have loved for me to have been a mathematician. No, uh, our joke in the family uh, growing up was always, if I was not a musician, I would be a street sweeper. So in a sense, it gave me the idea that I would not be able to be anything else. Once I chose my passion or my passion chose me, there was no other possibility in that sense. So in a sense, music actually chose me and I couldn't escape it. I couldn't get away from it. Yeah. So would I be anything else? I don't know. Uh, would I be a mathematician? Uh, I don't know. I would probably have been a sports guy. So I, in the beginning, I did gymnastics. I did judo with my father as well. So I was, since my dad had the musical brother already there, he would have preferred for me to be, you know, a, a judo guy or a, a gymnast, which I was actually pretty good at. Um, and I was doing competitions. I was even called to go to Havana and become a gymnast and, and study there. But I decided... No, I want to continue music, and I stayed. It was a family decision, too. But, you know, a seven-year-old going to Havana to study because he had good predisposition in sports would have been great, and I, would, I love sports. So I probably would have been a sports guy, not a street sweeper, which nothing wrong with it either. It was more the mental uh, idea of Charlie Chaplin, you know, sweeping streets and having, uh, having that visual example in our minds. <laughs> you got it. That's great. All right, I'm kicking it up to an adult here. Sophia, who's 42, wants to know, what was it like to play at Carnegie Hall? Oh, that's also a dream come true. Uh, it was amazing, an amazing experience. You, as a kid, growing up, of course, that's what you always think. And in Cuba, we were like, New York, USA, uh, the biggest stage on earth. Of course, that's your dream to go and perform somewhere. And to, to have a goal in your life is amazing to say, I want to be able to play there. I want to be able to be good enough to be worthy of such a space. And at the same time, to have that realization that, um, yeah, once you play there, you're like, oh, wait, it wasn't that hard. It's the beauty of dreams. And then what comes next, that once they're uh, upon a time, they're unattainable and they seem impossible. Then somehow you work, 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 work. You get there. You're like, 
oh, wait, this doesn't seem so much like a dream anymore because now you have other dreams like, hey, am I going to get invited back? And I did get invited back. And then I played a second time. And then I played a third time. I haven't been invited back again. So I still got to keep working. I got to keep my A game in order to keep going back because the dreams then now go to the next level, to the next level, not just be there, but play what and play with whom. And so the the growth of it is what's exciting to me, that you can accomplish dreams, but then it has to continue. We have to be a perpetual student forever. There's no stopping. We got to continue on and then have new goals, have new new practice ideas and, and keep going for it. So I, I definitely loved it playing in New York. Sophia, thanks for that question. That's a terrific question with a great response. Um, Sandra, who's eight, wants to know, are you a musical scientist? <laughs> well, now that you have said it, I will take the title and claim as my title, Dr. A, the musical scientist. I love it. That, um, is, that is how we're introducing you to the show. <laughs> there you go. No, I, I've never considered myself a musical scientist, but... In a sense, it has been my life to see that connection, to find the beauty of patterns in music. So in a sense, yes, I am, but like our children, without knowing it, without being Fair it, I, I am without knowing that I am, in a sense. So thank you for that. I'll put it in my resume. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. All right, last question for my guests here, and then we're going to get to the close of the program. So. Um, Pam with the Ohio Teaching Artist Registry wants to know, do you ever see forms or images while developing one of your works? And do you ever tell stories with your music? So that's Pam with the Ohio Teaching Artist Registry. Wonderful, Pam. So yes and yes and no. So I'll explain. So do I see images? Yes, because I, when I close my eyes, I have to imagine musical sections, musical aspects of something. I tried to go. I didn't until my teacher asked me the question, do you see it? And then I started exercising it to actually see the music. And your question might also mean as I'm making the work, I'm not a composer. So for me, it's the recreation of the work as a performer. I'm not consciously writing the work. So if I was the composer, then maybe yes, but I do not compose as much as I should. And as much as my teacher recommended, I become a composer because even if you're not good at it, it doesn't matter. The action of trying is what, what matters. So yes, I have images in my mind and stories. Oh my goodness. Every single piece I play has a story. Everything is going to be programmatic music, as they call it in the classical canon. I make a story for everything. It's for me, if I do not make a story, the audience will not hear anything. Whether they are thinking what I'm thinking is not the point. The point is that there's always something to communicate. And if you're just playing the notes on a blank slate for the note's sake, you are losing everything. For me, it's the connection with the musicians, with the audience, with my public. So connect, connect, connect. In a sense, I could not have a piece without a story. Some of them actually come with a story within them. I like to play List, The Valley of Oberman, and it's got poets and poems on the score. And I like to play Satie's um, Sports and Divertiments. He actually writes the story within the musical notation to tell you who's playing tennis, what water slide are they going down, who's rocking on a boat. So, of course, I put stories, I add stories, and I encourage everyone to have a storyline for every single piece they do, because as we said, music is poetry. You're listening to Dr. Alonzo, scholar, musician, incredible entertainer, and gifted teacher. Um, the very last question I will ask, but I'll piggyback off of a question from John T. So I'm a huge Buena Vista Social Club fan. So, <laughs> so my question for you, this is John T's question. So John, thank you for the question. A shout out to you. What Cuban musicians influence your musical style and spirit the most? Oh, that's, that's tough. Because Long list? Okay, top three. 
No, it's not even tough because it doesn't go from present. Like I like to play Cuban music with my brother. We like music from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So it's not necessarily even now, you know, music that we dance to or, you know, El Medico de la Salsa or El Gela Banda or Latin, you know, salsa bands that we used to dance to. But it's more the Perez Prados, the not so Cuban, but the Desi Arnaz of our, you know, generations and all of Omar Aportuondo from Buenavista Social Club. Of course, all of these musicians are amazing to us. And again, when we were in Cuba, we didn't think of them, oh, they have influenced me because we absorbed them so much that they're part of our blood and part of our DNA. You know, you listen to Chucho Valdez playing, you, you listen to Paquito de Rivera playing too when we were kids and now here in the U.S. So all those musical styles and musicians influenced us without even knowing. Of course, we were in the classical music world and we were training to become classical musicians playing Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart, but at the same time, you walk down the hall in your own music school, and someone is playing timba, and someone is playing salsa, and someone is playing, you know, every instrument known to men, and then you go home, and you're going to rest and watch some TV, and all of a sudden, the Afro-Cuban rituals that are happening above you for all hours of the night, then you're hearing <laughs> drums all night long, so it's... It, it never stopped. So Got to it. say one, two, three, it's all of them. Whether I like them or not, it's not the point. They all influenced me because they all came into my body and got absorbed somehow. So when I hear anything, I definitely want to move, definitely want to dance and definitely know the feeling. The most beautiful part is that it brings me back to Cuba when I hear it now. So, sure. you know, you have that memory of, Listening to a song in a specific period of time of your life, well, some of those things click, like my hometown in Santa Clara, some of them click Havana, some of them click travel, some of them click traveling to France from the USA. So it's music completely transports me to a, a different realm always. No, no that, that, that is terrific. All right, so we're getting to the close of the program. Um, before I get to the, the steam challenge that we do every um, Color Science show, well, you're listening to Color Science brought to you by Cosi Connects, the number one science museum in the nation, according to US Today. I'm Frederick Burley, President and CEO. I'm with my special guest, Dr. Alonzo, AKA Dr. A, the musical scientist. We figured that out. Um, and um, before I get to the share my screen with the steam challenge, I want to ask you something. I'd love for you to, to play a piece for us or recommend something um, that, that you would play for us. What would that be? Oh, well, one of my popular pieces that I use for encores all the time, it's Manuel de Faya's The Fire Dance. So it could leave you fiery and excited about music. So you can definitely listen to The Fire Dance.
So again, ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute pleasure to interview Dr. Orlai Alonzo, a.k.a. Dr. A, the musical scientist um, for the Color Science Program. We're now at our STEAM challenge. Every, as you all know, every show we have a challenge um, to really show the incredible diversity in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And we have a great theme. This theme this month is music and math music and math. So come up with any 2D, 3D, actually it might even be a musical composition you come up with and you submit it. Submit that to Vanessa Bowers, that's vbowers at cosi.org. The deadline is one month from today, November 4th. Send that out um, and we will pick um, a first place, second place, and third place winner. As you remember, the third prizes are Cosi Connects kit, the second prize is a hologram machine, and the third and the first prize is an iPad mini. So again, submit your 2D or 3D or any inspired STEM STEAM connection combining music and math to Vanessa Bowers at COSA.org. We look forward to your submissions as always, and we'll pick a winner and let you know who that is. With that, I'd like to close by welcome, by thanking my distinguished guest, Dr. Orlai Alonzo. I'm going to unshare my screen. Dr. Alonzo, thank you for being with us on COSI Connects, brought to you. Sorry, thank you for being on Color of Science, brought to you by COSI Connects. The last words are yours, then I'll sign off the program. What is your last word to the universe of people thank you. in your mind? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. B. Thank you, COSI, for inviting me to share my ideas, my thoughts with the children, with the uh, COSI family. So that's all I have to say is thank you, be well, and again, go make music, Go make math and go connect them in any way you can. I'm going to try to submit something too. So I hope I, I qualify for the age. You definitely category. qualify. You definitely <laughs> qualify. Listen, Dr. Lazo, thank you so much for being on the show. I want to thank Vanessa Bowers, who produces the show, The Color of Science, Digital yes. Edition. And remember, if you're looking behind me and you see that beautiful shield, we announced to the world we're opening up Marvel November 26th through May 30th. So make sure you come to COSI and check out that. Um, but in the meantime, play some piano, play that violin, hum some music, think of Dr. Alonzo. We'll keep the light on for you at COSI. Thanks so much. <laughs>